Welcome to the Braemar Life Skills Academy podcast. The world is changing faster than ever, and the world of education is too. Advances in psychology, biology, and a whole range of other fields have opened up new lines of thought about the purpose of school and how it can best serve a new generation of students. Join me on the Braemar Life Skills Academy podcast every week to explore these new ideas. In last week's episode, I had a great chat with Dr. Dina Kara Schaefer. Uh, Dr. Schaefer is the Director of Student Services at York University, uh, an expert when it comes to engagement with nature and the implications for learning and retention on students and all things learning strategy. It is an episode not to be missed, so don't. In today's episode, I'll be talking to Dora Onyakwari and Zoe Wong, the Braemar College Nurses in Residence. Welcome back to another episode of the Braemar Life Skills Academy podcast. My name is Mike here at the Sound Studio at Braemar College in downtown Toronto. Today I am joined by our nurses in residence here at Braemar College, Dora and Zoe. Dora and Zoe, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Good. Thank you for having us. We're doing good. Yeah. <laughs> Be doing better once I stop being nervous about this podcast. Uh, we're going to dig into uh, the experience of nursing students at TMU and your experiences here in our hopefully representative uh, Toronto High School, talking about student health, what you've seen and what you might suggest for them moving forward. But we want to start with the two of you and just give the folks at home a little bit of a sense of who you are and, and how you've arrived in this position. So, Dora, I'm going to uh, start with you. Tell us about yourself, your background, how you ended up at, at TMU, and maybe a couple of hopes for the future. Okay, um, so I am an international student from Nigeria. Um, so I'm, I'm currently obviously a third year student, a third year nursing student at TMU. Um, so I first uh, got into York University for biology. But then um, I felt like that wasn't really what I wanted to do. So I switched to nursing at TMU. And also, um, I feel like my drive, like, I feel like I love helping people. And that's like the thing that like drove me into like going into nursing school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right on. Zoe, same my thing? Turn. Yeah. Similar. I'm not an international student. Um, so for me, I went into TMU straight out of high school. Uh, initially, I had the intention of going into med school, but mm -hmm. I think I was influenced heavily by my sister, who is also a nurse. So she opened me to the world of nursing and showed me that um, there's a lot more pathways as compared to medical school, because the, I would say, stereotypical way would be, you know, pursue a health science or life science degree. Mm -hmm. And after you write your MCAT and hopefully if you pass, then you get into med school. But if you don't make it into MCAT, you're kind of left with a degree that doesn't guarantee any job mm -hmm. security. So um, nursing was a very good way of stepping into the medical field while also having a safety net of job security after you're done graduating. Okay. Yeah. So, Dora, for you, the, the incentive was uh, mostly outward-looking, empathy, helping people, and, mm -hmm. and you thought this would be maybe the most direct way to do that. And Zoe, thinking about it from a very, I think, practical academic standpoint, yeah. not wanting to be left with a health sciences degree that didn't really look like it was going anywhere yeah. and feeling mm -hmm. like this was a route to the type of interactions and being in the health world that you wanted. Have I yeah. got that about right? Yeah, I think Dora might more have been a born saint in this mm. sense, and I definitely <laughs> fell in love with the practice and the and the empathetic parts of it after. Yeah. But I definitely understand, um, you know, helping people mm -hmm. and how great it is and the feeling of it afterwards. Yeah. I fell in love with that. I it's more like so. I for me, I think about it as. Um, so I love helping people, but like, how can I bring about a change? Mm like, you know, world wild. Yeah. I mean, I tell you, when I think of the applied sciences and what that, that word means, I can't think of anything more representative than nursing, where mm -hmm. you do have this this pretty serious body of knowledge underneath you, this, this foundation that you're working with, health sciences, biology, physiology, etc. Mm -hmm. But you are on the front lines, right? You are in the mm -hmm. muck working uh, most immediately with, mm -hmm. in, in this case, students, but mm -hmm. you know, in a hospital setting with patients, in a permanent care or hospice setting, you're, you're, you're dealing with some of the harshest and, and most difficult realities in life and bringing to it 
this 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 knowledge that you've accrued uh, through TMU and through these experiences like your practicum. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really quite something. I actually think of it as being um, sort of in the same world as teaching, mm-hmm. where where there's that same dynamic of yes, we have our theory and our pedagogy, but we mm-hmm. are first and foremost relational professionals, right? We are we are face to face with with the the client or or the the victim. Um, mm-hmm. Can you talk to us a little bit about the experience at TMU? Maybe getting into university and finding your feet there in general, and then especially what are the demands of, of a nursing student um, in university and, and what kind of person may be best suited uh, to working in that world? That's a very big one. Do you want to tackle mm-hmm. it or do you want me to? You can go first. Okay, um, I guess first and foremost, um, in terms of the requirements for nursing, uh, mm-hmm. I guess we're if we're starting from high school, um, obviously you need your biology, you need your English, your math. Um, and I would say that getting into university for nursing is quite competitive at the moment. Mm-hmm. So you're definitely looking at grades or averages that are eighties plus, um, just for consideration, not even a guaranteed spot. Mm-hmm. Um, but as for the part in university itself, um, you basically have two aspects, um, or three actually. So one would be the learning um, in terms of classes, lectures, the theory. Um, the second part would be labs, uh, which is a setting where you learn the clinical skills and where mm-hmm. you practice. So um, for example, we learned about a little bit TMI, but Foley insertions and stuff like that, mm-hmm. um, or how to clean patients or how to dress their wounds. And then the last aspect would be the clinical placements. So for example, um, at Bremer College, this is my clinical placement this semester. Um, It's community-based and it's focused on community health this semester. But um, for placements, the interesting thing is that to graduate, um, you have a set amount of hours that you need to complete. So similar to a high school setting where you need, I believe, 40 volunteer hours. Mm -hmm. Um, For university as a nursing student, you need a little bit of... I think maybe uh, roughly around 1500 hours of clinical experience, which is separated into the semesters. So during the semester for this year, we have um, seven hour shifts. So at Braemar College, we come here every Tuesday, Wednesday. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the what's expected. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a hot. Yeah, you kind of get used to it. Um, I, it eases you in, which is mm. what I appreciate. Um, as for what kind of students are more suited to nursing, I think people that you know want to get into healthcare, but don't really know where to start or don't know how they want to branch out later in life, I think nursing is a very well-rounded career because there's so many different um, job pathways. For example, you know you can work in the hospital setting. You can work in long-term care. You can work at a school. Um, and if you know if you like the desk job, there's always telehealth, mm-hmm. where you can you know work from home, answer phone calls, um, and kind of provide resources to different people. Yeah, those sort of distance health services becoming yeah. so much more important yeah. these days, right? Same sort of question, Dora. What's your experience at, at TMU been like, and and maybe where do you hope it takes you? So for me, um, when I hear like demands of um, nursing school, I think about uh, decreased social interaction. Mm. <laughs> so <laughs> basically, being in nursing school, you can't be partying. Like you, you just can't be going out anytime you want. And I think anyone can go to nursing school, but you just have to be. Um, so anyone can go to nursing school, but you have to be willing to, you know, like um, work hard. And you also have to be willing to like have um, sleepless nights. You have to be willing to um, have that driving you just for you to keep going because nursing school can be so stressful and yeah, it can be mentally draining too, hmm. but it's, it's definitely worth it. Well, I've, I've gotten some sense of that firsthand from yourselves. Um, I, I remember one instance in particular where I think we were talking about different projects and maybe some mm-hmm. presentations you were going to do for our students, yeah. and I had totally failed to take into account that you were moving into a, a pretty hefty period, like an exam prep period. Yeah. And and I like I'm only thinking about the school, and I'm thinking of yourselves as only being <laughs> you know here doing this work, and I totally forget you've got this this entire other world of work to, to be accountable to. And it's yeah. I've, I've, we've been very appreciative of the energy that you've brought because mm-hmm. I see 
see you with the students at lunch times and after schools and in the afternoons every single day, yeah. like bringing that that vibe um, mm-hmm. it, with, without without some of the yeah. honestly the exhaustion and the and yeah. you know the pessimism that comes with yeah. exhaustion um, and we're all vulnerable to that. But you've seemed like the the kind of people you're describing who are going to do okay in, in mm-hmm. nursing school and successful afterwards because mm-hmm. you've, you've managed those demands, at least from the outside. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well. I've seen some classmates that are also partiers mm. and mm. kudos to them. I, th- I genuinely, I respect them so much. I, mm. I, I think that they're powerhouses, right? How, you know, one weekend they're partying, you know, going crazy, but then they're also getting 90s mm-hmm. in university. Mm-hmm. And, you know, some people may not disagree with the partying thing, but I think as long as you have your priorities straight, mm-hmm. as long as your other aspects in life aren't being sacrificed, then I see no issue. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You can help me out with something that I'm a bit confused by. There seems to be a few different accounts of this. We hear quite often um, in the news here in Ontario mm-hmm. that we are in the midst of a brutal nursing shortage. And mm-hmm. having just done a little bit of research on this, uh, the most recent article I could find was March 8th. So we're sitting here near the end of March. March 8th, the CBC reported that projections over the next five years estimate that we will be short 33,000 nurses and personal service workers. And this is in part due to something like 21 billion in um, uh, deficit funding Mm -hmm. uh, for projected needs in in the various settings that nurses and personal service workers may find themselves in. But we're sitting here talking about how difficult it is to get into a nursing program and the seriousness and and sort of the specialism of the people who succeed in it. How do we square that circle? How, how, How are we in a world where we are in such desperate need of people like yourselves in volume, and yet it, it seems like the universities uh, are, are making it still quite difficult to access these programs. I, I think that it's, it's necessary for it to be a hard program to get into or to graduate. Cause you know, at the end of the day, if you mess up in nursing, you can end up killing somebody, it's consequential, right? Yeah. It, yeah, I think the stakes are a lot higher compared to some other professions. Not to downplay those, but I think no. when you're dealing with a human life, it's a little bit different. Yeah, good point. Um, but as for the shortage, I think the biggest issue would be how the healthcare system is inherently formed. Um, in a sense that I guess the the best example that I could draw is um, in terms of funding and mm-hmm. um, the wages. The starting salary is great. I'm not going to lie. Um, And because nurses, the job predominantly is unionized, you're, you know, you're starting off at a pretty good rate and whatnot, but there's not a lot of growth. Mm. So compared to, let's say, a stereotypical business job, you know, you can move from company to company. You can always negotiate your wages, promotions and whatnot. Um, You don't get that in nursing. Um, So I see nurses that, you know, work five years and I think that five years I think is the first wage increase Mm -hmm. and it's negligible Mm. um at that point you might as well not even give me a um, a wage increase um some nurses that you know work 25 years I think it might be just a few dollars and that's the consequence of working in a unionized um profession um and we're not even allowed I'm saying we're I'm not a nurse yet but Mm -hmm. from what I've heard they're not even allowed to strike Mm -hmm. um because, you know, if you who's going to provide for the patients then, right? Yeah. If all of us are on strike. So there's a legal obligation for us to, st- uh, for us to stay on the job. Um, but I think the government tried making amends to that. You know, if you heard about the whole $5,000 thing um, last year. I haven't. You haven't? No. Uh, okay. So um, the Ford government basically said that... Um, in light of the pandemic and the nursing shortage will reward each full-time nurse or whatever, um, a total payment of $5,000 in two payments. So each payment would be 2,500. Um, and I think a lot of people took that as a slap in the face cause it's, I think a wage increase is deserved. A lot of people do, but then the way that they framed it was more like, you know, thanks for your work. Here's a prize. Right. And this isn't a prize. This is something that should be given. Um, and people also realize that it could have been a means to get votes because the second payment was it would only come through if the Florida government would be reelected. That's what I heard, wow. allegedly. So, um, yeah, 
and there's not a lot of support for hospital staff. Um, for example, staff rooms. It's you're given maybe a microwave, a fridge, a few tables, a few chairs, and that's it. Um, as a shift worker, you're working 12-hour shifts, right? So um, night shifts, it's brutal. You need you need naps. You need to sleep just to stay awake so you don't make any mm-hmm. consequential mistakes. Yeah. Um, so we're kind of left with such little or poor resources, whereas compared to other jobs, you see them having full-fledged lounges, couches, free coffee, with a lot of snacks and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. it hurts, not going to lie. Yeah. Um, but it is what it is. And then the whole agency thing right now, it's a complete mess too. Um, where hospitals are outsourcing nurses from agencies because the agencies pay so much more. And for some reason, the hospital budget is going towards agencies rather than investing in their own nurses and staff. So you have nurses from hospital A going to hospital B making more money. And Mm -hmm. nurses from hospital B going to hospital A making more money when it's still the same pool of nurses within Ontario, but it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. I mean, I've become quite cynical about the sort of dynamics of publicly funded, socialized um, institutions in the midst of a Mm -hmm. otherwise capitalist system. Like we have, my my parents are both public school teachers. I I grew up with the, um, the, the, uh, work to rule actions and the strikes that, that kind of characterized the late 90s and early thousands mm-hmm. in, in education here. Um, but what, what you're describing, actually, it makes me think of um, prison system in the United States. Like yeah. this is this is supposed to be um, supposed to serve a very specific focus. And it's, it's supposed to that focus is supposed to be clear amongst the, the public. And yet we have a whole bunch of trouble getting it properly funded to the point where we now have private prisons yeah. taking you know, contracts from the government <laughs> and not that, you know, they don't have the same regulations that, that mm-hmm. these other prisons do, right? They're, they don't have the same oversight that we'd expect yeah. from our public system. So our schools are interrogated, our hospitals are interrogated, our prisons are interrogated. They all deserve funding proportionate to that expectation. And mm-hmm. yet we're, we're outsourcing nurses from private clinics now, yeah. right? It's, mm-hmm. This isn't in the purview of the podcast. We can't really break down the economics of our healthcare yeah, system. Yeah, it's but, way too big to tackle. Yeah, um, but I do appreciate your candor uh, about it. And, and I, I guess uh, good to be going into the career with eyes wide open and and hopefully in the midst of some pretty serious change. Right? This, this feels like a period where things are changing in a, in a whole bunch of ways in these sectors and maybe for the better in your cases as well. Yeah, fingers mm-hmm. crossed. Dora, any, I just, any thoughts? <laughs> so I just wanted to add to what Zoe said. Um, definitely from what I've heard, like nurses are not being paid as they should. And that has also been why like most nurses, most nurses literally like quit their jobs. For example, if they're doing like bedside nursing, like most of them quit their jobs to go to a different nursing job. So like travel nursing, because most nurses are like, oh, travel nursing like pays more compared to like bedside nursing. So that could also be why, you know, like there's a um, shortage of um, bedside nurses as well. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it, makes, it makes perfect sense to me, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's it's one of... I don't think anyone's confused about this. This is one of the toughest jobs in our society, mm-hmm. right? Like, it's it's not just the labor, and it's not just the knowledge, and it's not mm-hmm. just the trauma and the, and the tragedy that are regularly a part of your, your experience. It's that you're doing it all at the same time while being underpaid. Yeah. It right. feels awkward to agree, because <laughs> I don't want to be like, oh my gosh, I'm the victim or, or whatnot, but it is the unfortunate truth, yeah. I would yeah. say. But. Well, uh, you know, I, I think we, we, the more conversations like this are had, whether they're public or private, um, yeah, are, are, are part of the solution. So um, I'm glad that we were able to talk at least a little bit about yeah. that yeah. that aspect of this this profession openly. Mm-hmm. You've spent the last uh, couple months helping out here at Braemar and working with a bunch of our teenage students. Of course, mm. these are students from all over the world, and they're coming to us with a, a massive range of mm. representative situations. Some of them come to us in absolutely robust health, and they're, they're social butterflies, and they're crushing their classes, and you, you've met a few of the, these kids, yeah. and they're, yeah. it's just an awful lot of fun to work with them. But one of the, the dynamics that's at play, I think, in pretty much every school and maybe just every family and social mm. situation is that those those types, those ones who are having all that outward success can sort of um, distract us or, or hide the quiet ones who, who may be suffering in a, in a massive range of ways. And you've, you're, you're on the front lines here. You're experiencing 
through testimony and through witness every single day yeah. what that looks like. So just, you know, you, you said it was a big question earlier. I'm, I'm becoming somewhat known for those. I'm just going to throw <laughs> out another big one. What, what are the major challenges that you're seeing as being especially unique to teenage health uh, these days? And, and maybe just a few examples of what that might look like. In general, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I would say um, socially, like um, peer pressure, um, having, you know, like um, pressure from friends, um, them making you do what you don't want to do. So it's basically like when you don't want to do things, maybe like participate in activities or just, um, I guess, unhealthy behaviors, I would say. Um, but because of, you know, like the group you follow because of your friends, then you have to do it. I think that's a big thing with teenagers, like basically um, peer pressure, like following people to do what you don't want to do just because of that pressure. And also I would say, um, bullying as well. So bullying is a big thing. Like I talked about in the, um, mental health in the mental health, um, Sorry. <laughs> presentation? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like that I was, talked about that was the presentation you guys yeah, just gave yeah, last the week, presentation. Right? <laughs> so like the, like I talked about in the in the mental health presentation, um, a lot of people see this as fun and games, but is it really fun? Like mm. is it really just something you can just, you know, like do to someone and then they get over it? No. Like it impacts people. Um, it has, you know, like a mental health effect on people and also like you never know what someone is going through. So it's also nice to be compassionate and like be kind to them. Um, I think like bullying, the thing with bullying is that, um, yes, you think it's fun, but also like you don't know how the other person feels. And sometimes like um, people could, you know, due to bullying, like people could experience social isolation as well. So like keeping themselves away from people, like not wanting to interact with people because of that experience they had, like that bullying experience they had. Yeah, I think some overlooked parts of bullying is the in initial intention. Mm -hmm. um, I think some people, their intentions aren't to put down others. It's more so they want to... Just do make themselves fun. feel better and yeah. and you know sometimes i look f or p the bullies could look for fault in other people mm -hmm. and use it to justify something for about themselves and th hurting somebody else's feelings might just have been the byproduct of that right yeah um so i, I guess that's just like my little two cents about bullying so it's it's wait so you're saying it's more like them um trying to feel good about themselves yeah by putting other people yeah it, down. it might not be you know i i don't like this student therefore i want to put them down it might just be they might not get enough attention at home mm -hmm. or they might feel poorly about themselves in any kind of way and to mitigate for that they want to boost themselves up by somehow putting down somebody else Mm -hmm. I've been on the receiving end of it, and I don't think that person, like the people, particularly hated me. I think I was just an easy s thing for them to step on, um, mm -hmm. so they could, you know, get some higher ground. And to be honest, it still somewhat haunts me to this yeah. day the effects of it. Um, but you know, stuff happens, and you you learn from it. Well, I, I hope so. Um, but I think we're at this point we're we're pretty aware of how how much we walk around as adults with yeah. our childhoods, right? It, 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 it does almost feel some days as though like I've got a 15-year-old me and a 10-year-old me and a 6-year-old me kind of just like walking alongside and like informing my reactions, <laughs> my instincts, you know, my prejudices, my, my, my emotions, etc. I, I think that there's a lot of good psychology going on right now, mm -hmm. attachment theory and, and everything that's come out of it about – you know, we, we never really leave our childhoods, right? Like they, they end up, we, the, what's the phrase from Freud? Um, he said, the child is the father of the man. We might update that to the child is the father of the person wow. or the parent of the person, I should say. <laughs> um, yeah, profound and, and well worth yeah. thinking about. But I mean, all you have to do is sit here for a couple seconds thinking about your own fears and prejudices and, and you can pretty easily trace them back to usually mm -hmm. instances of unfairness or, yeah. or an abuse of power, whether it was from a parent or a teacher or a bully or whatever else, sometimes a friend um, that happens in our childhood. As you said, um, 
And I am really interested that when I bring up teen health, I think for a lot of people, when they think of the nursing station, they think of like cuts and bruises and you just know, give them a bag of ice, exactly, right? <laughs> yeah, that, that kind of thing. But you went right to the social and the mental health. And yeah. that speaks to, I think, the, the level of awareness and the level of seriousness in those yeah. two, two fields right now in teen mental health. We know that there are specific differences between the teenage brain and the, the adult brain um, to most significantly manifest first as uh, less risk aversion. Mm -hmm. So they're, everybody's averse to risk, but teenagers are willing to take more of them or that, that line is a little further for them. And then speaking to your point, Zoe, yeah. the, the almost obsessive awareness of social hierarchies. Yeah. Right? Like to, it, it's, it, it's interesting to think back and remember how important the cool kids seemed to me when I was 14, yeah. right? Like just being in class and knowing, knowing intimately Mm -hmm. uh, the structure of that hierarchy and where I fit in it. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of kids out there who, who are somewhere in the middle of that hierarchy mm -hmm. and they're, they're just taking the, the garbage that's being put on them from the top and passing it right on to those beneath them. And the ones beneath them are kind of thinking like, oh, well, this, this must be because of who I am, because of yeah. what I'm putting out into the world. I must mm -hmm. change all of that, right? I must, I must burn all of this excess off of me. When in reality, it's got nothing to do with who you are, right? It's, it's, it's another person feeling hurt by another person who was probably hurt, right, in, in some other ways. I, I don't remember uh, ever seeing a representation of a bully who didn't also have some form of abuse or trauma in their life. Right. Right. Yeah. So that, that's that's a lot of summary work there. But, I mean, your, your experience is, is lockstep with, with what I've seen in schools yeah. since, since teaching in them. Um, you really emphasized when we were talking about maybe having this podcast conversation uh, mental health yeah. and especially as a function of mental health, healthy relationships. Yes. That seemed like something that was a real passion for, for both of you. And so I want to just kind of open the floor up for you guys to talk a little bit about um, what exactly we mean by a healthy relationship versus the alternative, uh, what that looks like yeah. in, in the healthy development of, of, a, of a teenager um, in a school setting, perhaps, mm -hmm. and uh, what are the, the outcomes? What are, what are the benefits? What do we hope for? So when we talk about healthy relationships, I would say a healthy relationship is one where you can, um, where you respect each other, um, where you trust each other, and also just basically one where you, you're free to voice your concerns. And um, like the person, like the other person doesn't put you down for like voicing your concerns and like tries to like understand you and your point of view. Um, and I think that um, it, is, it is essential for people to know how to form healthy relationships because sometimes um, you see most people in like unhealthy relationships and they don't even know that they're in unhealthy relationships or maybe they know but then it's difficult for them to get out of that unhealthy relationship. How do you think that works? What, I'm sure it, it's a case for, for all of us to varying degrees but it's weird that we can't we usually can't see the, the toxic relationship in our lives. Yeah. What's going on there? So I would say um, when talking about like toxic relationships, so sometimes I would say we not knowing that you're in a toxic relationship is also um, when we make ex excuses for people. It's like you don't see it, but like other people see it. So sometimes it's like, OK, for you to kind of ask people, for example, like if I have a friend right now and um probably like you know like it's we're all like having fun and all those things and it's like you have a group of friends but you have that one person that you hang out with the most and your other friends are like telling you oh you know like this person has like this attribute so this person acts this way and um you make excuses for the person but it's like others see it so that kind of thing can kind of like point out can tell you that oh there's something wrong yeah. so it's like when you consult other people they can kind of point that out and tell you that this is unhealthy that this is what this person is doing that it's un that is unhealthy so i think the yeah. real lesson there being that we we need to cultivate multiple relationships mm -hmm. right? we need to have a yeah. network and not just it, it's interesting that the most toxic relationships seem to have this um this dynamic where they cause you to contract they mm -hmm. cause you to pull away from other friendships mm -hmm. and, and yeah. sort of isolate yeah. yourself with that one person. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. it, it's it, it's also interesting to, th to think of the comparisons between that type of behavior and the b behavior we may see in someone who is substance addicted. 
right? It's yeah. it, it's basically it's an overlap, right? But yeah. I also think like uh, speaking anecdotally for me, I've been in toxic relationships before, and it's not like I didn't know, mm. right? Mm. I, there's a lot of self denial. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Like when I was in one, I think I let a lot of things slide. Yeah. Um, and I would make excuses for the person, and I knew that I was putting myself in a very unfair place but i think the rationale was you know i'm already i've already been in this relationship for x amount of time i already put up with this much stuff it's not like i can't keep doing it Mm -hmm. um or and it was also the argument of the heartbreak that i would face if i were to end things would Mm -hmm. is probably more painful than what i'm going through now um, you know, which is, to be honest, kind of true. Mm. But the th- the thing is also the heartbreak doesn't last forever after it ends, right? It, it's it, you, it, if, if we want to visualize it, it's like you see this giant tsunami and you're like, oh my God, I don't want to go that way because it's just going to, you know, wash over me and crash everything that I've built. But then, you know, it doesn't last forever. There's, <laughs> there's always after the storm kind of beauty. Um, and I think you, you never realize until you're actually at that spot yeah and sometimes you just have to take that leap of faith and um you know terminate things mm-hmm. yeah in your own way yeah Ch- change I, is hard right yeah, yeah exactly like we are not built for it. it it's our darn uh, evolutionary biology makes us bad long-term thinkers right like we we yeah. take short-term gratification every time and if that short-term gratification just means i don't have to have that argument with that person today and i can just keep kind of right. suffering in a very mild way or a comparatively yeah. <laughs> mild way that beats the heck out of like having it out with them and like yeah. making this major change in my life because mm-hmm. i can't i can't feel what it's going to feel like a month from now when i breathe that first massive sigh of relief and start yeah. getting some perspective it's amazing how much we can endure that's the one mm-hmm. like <sighs> it, 21 years of age i know it's not a lot <laughs> um but that's the biggest thing that i've learned it's yeah. you know humans we're not particularly strong com- like physically you know our skin is very easily puncturable mm-hmm. but then mm-hmm. i think our strength but also our weakness is our mind we can, we we are in, able to endure such harsh conditions, um, which you know sometimes you have to, and that's a good thing, but sometimes you don't, and you subject yourself to it, and it, it just gets dragged on. But yeah, that's so well said. Yeah, it's I. I just want to highlight that. that idea. <laughs> like it's amazing what we can endure, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. but we don't always have to. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think we do, we do sometimes valorize our endurance, right? Like, I'm going to get yeah. through this. And we, we take really, pride in it. We need a friend who kind of just takes a size, mm-hmm. like, you know, you don't have to. And, yeah. And you don't have to do it alone, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Um, so, obviously, teenagers are very vulnerable to, yeah. to these kinds of forces. And um, without some of the experience that maybe even a 21-year-old would be yeah. able to, to lend them. And so, thank goodness, we build hopefully healthy relationships amongst ourselves as professionals and then... Um, in the, as much as we can in, in those uh, dynamics with those younger than us and those uh, somewhat who fall in our, our purview. I don't want to say in our power, but mm-hmm. um, we do have some authority here. Um, how can we help young people to want healthy relationships, to be able to recognize what that looks like and, and to pursue them in their lives? Yeah. So as you said, we're, we're subject to a lot of peer pressure, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of hierarchy <laughs> nonsense, right? We got all this all these crazy divergent forces in our brain it can be tough to Mm -hmm. you know look for what's good and insist on it in our lives what can we do so first thing i would say um just encouraging people to be themselves because you want to be able to like have a healthy relationship with yourself and Mm -hmm. because Obviously, sometimes we might think like we're not the problem, but we might actually be the problem. So I would say encourage people to be themselves. Um, You want people to, um, you know, like learn to set boundaries. You want to be able to like set boundaries. You want to know what is right and what is wrong, like what you think is right or what you think is wrong. And also let other people know that this is your boundaries like that you have set and they can't, you know, like cross those boundaries. And you also um, want to like practice self-love. You want to learn about yourself, know what you like and like what you dislike. So I think just knowing things about yourself and constantly growing um, 
would definitely help you, you know, like form other relationships with people because um, also by, you know, like not being toxic to others, then you would figure out like how to um, connect with others, like make good connection with others and yeah, form healthy relationships. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think bridging off of that, um, there's always an educational aspect. Mm-hmm. But then the thing with teens is that it doesn't matter how much you shove something in their ear, it just comes out the other ear. Um, <laughs> I remember, like, honestly, I still have the mentality of a teen. So a lot of times when people make the effort to teach me something, I just brush it off. But from what I've experienced, I think playing into human nature, monkey see, monkey do, right? Yeah. The best form of picking something up is by observing people around you which is why i think like nowadays um why we love tiktok it's because we like relatable content Mm. and i think that's one of the best things that we can harness in terms of helping teens it's play into that relatability right um if you're standing on a high horse trying to teach them something about self-love yet you know you're putting on a facade of some sort it's not going to stick with them, right? Mm-hmm. So I always, in, when I was in high school, I loved the teachers that were genuinely comfortable with themselves, that were a little bit goofy, mm-hmm. or they knew that they were loud and they weren't afraid of, like, you know, to show it. Um, and that made me feel really, really good. Mm-hmm. And that made me embrace my inner weirdness because, you know, my teacher, somebody that we're supposed to look up to, is like me. Or, um, or you know, if you're scrolling on TikTok... You know, I, I think as a girl, you know, you can, you can get insecure about a lot of things. But then, for example, body hair, right? We, yeah. we talk, touched on this in our presentations. Yeah. Um, I think our goal of, of the presentations was to kind of open up the doors for conversation and use relatability to show others. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, relatability. I yeah. think that's a really big thing. And also, in terms of relationships, I've noticed that a lot of times um, people go, jump from strangers to friends and they forget that acquaintances exist mm. and mm. and it's not just for teens i have seen this in the workplace with full-fledged adults um first day they meet and then second day like oh my god they're like hugging and stuff like that and i'm like there's no boundaries that were set and True. because we want to humans you know we like to communicate we like to be empathetic towards others which is great but then we get lost in that and then we forget to set our own boundaries and then Unfortunately, sometimes we get hurt. So I've been reminding myself um, and also other people that remember acquaintances exist. Um, Don't always be a yes man and try to Mm -hmm. appeal to other people and sacrificing yourself for, you know, the benefit of others and stuff like that. Yeah. I think that's so insightful. Um, One of (laughs) of the bigger sort of lighting bulbs that ever went off over my head was when someone um, said friendship is... The definition of friendship is mutually accelerating disclosure. Yeah. Mutually accelerating disclosure. And I was like, of course it is. <laughs> that is <laughs> yes, Eureka. that's exactly how it goes. Um, and you can imagine like your your relationship with your best friend, whoever, mm-hmm. whoever that may be. And what a joy it is to sort of go tit for tat back and forth with these disclosures about ourselves. Like what a relief to finally be able to t- talk without pretension without, you know, without faking that I'm something Mm -hmm. that I'm not, right? To feel completely comfortable and easy expressing my doubts, expressing my failures. It's it's wonderful. And that disclosure accelerates to hopefully an appropriate level where you both meet each other, you're, you're, you've pretty much disclosed what you plan to, and that's your, your friendship. When we lack those relationships, as you just described, I I like the idea of there being kind of these levels or these maybe, um, um, what's a target where you have the concentric circles right? yeah there's you and then maybe you've got your closest like almost yeah. like family your mm-hmm. brothers your sisters right yeah. and then there's friends and and acquaintances right like yeah. it's okay yeah. to live in this <laughs> level for the, the a while the bubble of acquaintances yeah. you know it's screw the friend like, zone i know you you know <laughs> me but is... we're not necessarily friends it's cool i can ask yeah. you for a pen in class right i don't, yeah. I don't feel uncomfortable around yes. you mm-hmm. and that's that's a really cool way to go through life we need it when we don't have any of that the really good stuff in the middle, when we don't have that wonderful best friend or couple friends who we really can be ourselves with, mm-hmm. we're desperate mm-hmm. for it, right? It's a yeah. very felt need in our lives. And so we race towards that disclosure yeah. with the, the very first person who comes in, right? We don't yeah. set the boundary. Mm-hmm. We say, I'm so excited to tell you everything <laughs> about me. Let's, <laughs> let's have a sleepover, right? Yeah. And, and the person's yeah. like, 
who we just met yesterday, right? Exactly. And, mm -hmm. and you can see that dynamic at play in, in uh, high school social situations exactly. where the coolest person, the mm -hmm. coolest person, yeah. is the one who's willing to hold back that disclosure a little bit and just kind of like let it go right. naturally, right? The mm -hmm. one who's super eager to tell you everything about themselves, that's the one where everyone's kind of like, okay, all right, we're yeah. going to keep this person over here. Exactly. Our sound engineer loves it when I get really active with my, with my demonstrations because then she's got to balance out all of my talking. Around. <laughs> I'll try to do as little of that as possible, yeah. Ingrid. Yeah, so I, seeing that dynamic at play and assuming that it is fairly universal that this is pretty much what's going on in the social lives of teenagers uh, everywhere, mm -hmm. in a school setting, which is... It mimics life in some ways, but it, it is pretty artificial, right? We don't spend much of natural life moving the way that we move or interacting the way that we interact in school. So in as much as they're in this setting for a huge number of hours, thousands of hours in their teenage lives, mm -hmm. are there ways that we can design schools differently? Or have you imagined while you've been here at Braemar sort of services or interactions that maybe a school could facilitate that would better create, better accommodate healthy relationships yeah i mean do you want to bring up the fact the conversation we had before this podcast about how f the friendships formed in high school are, like why it's superficial i feel like you should probably talk about yeah. that yeah. Do, do you want to or do you want me to go for you it, go for it. <laughs> so we we wanted to do some prep work for the podcast um we were looking over you know the topics and then uh, the thing that we came to realize was that Unfortunately, a lot of friendships in high, like after high school kind of seem to dissipate. Mm. And we've come to the realization that a lot of times it's because that the friendships were born out of the fact that we see this person every single day mm -hmm. and we're forced to be in this place every single day. It's not like we bonded over the same values or the same interests and whatnot. It's more like, oh, we're in the same math class. Okay, now we're friends. And there wasn't enough. There's not enough substance to hold the friendship out of high school. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a mutual survival exactly, aspect to it, right? right? It's like, what do we have in common? We're both suffering through this. Yeah. So, so I, I think to tie it in with the question that you just brought up would, I think, maybe creating clubs that are more so focused around interests mm -hmm. rather than, um, well, I, I guess there's not much to compare it to. Because I know we have like the wellness club and yeah. cooking club and people. That's I what think, came to mind. Yeah. So I think people can't come because they want to experience something. And, you know, I, I think that's amazing. I never had that in high school. Um, so kudos to that. But from, from my high school experience, um, there was anime club. So we're on the same wave. Like I was just thinking. <laughs> exactly. About anime club. Right. Um, anime club or there's like an arts committee, business mm -hmm. committee, stuff like that. Um, and I think that's also why universities, you can make a lot more meaningful friendships. Mm. It's because people that choose these programs, obviously they have some, something in interest, like, you know, some commonalities, which is mm -hmm. why, you know, we chose nursing because we like to care for people and mm -hmm. that's probably something that we can bond even after university right yeah. so if we have something in high school that's you know I don't, I don't think well some people go through their anime phases and some people don't um, it might <laughs> stick with them forever like me um so i think that would be a good way to facilitate meaningful friendships just bonding over common yeah. interests it's a really good call it reminds me of what you said about that kind of top down like being up on a high horse and and yeah. telling them like we do have we have a creatives club, we have a wellness club, um, and we have a student round table. Yeah. And those are those three, there's others, there's the, the philosophy and debate club and the cooking club and, and a couple others, and those might be a bit more interest-based, but those three in particular are very prescriptive. Yeah. Like they were stuff that, that I don't think it would be hard for an outsider to guess that they were designed by an administrator right like, <laughs> yeah like and and it again i say it's prescriptive mm -hmm. we want students to be well we mm -hmm. want them to have a space to talk about difficult issues we want them to have an avenue towards creativity and conversations about that but none of those three things would happen naturally exactly right like mm -hmm. no students are getting together and, and saying like i'm poorly would you like to discuss how to get well <laughs> <laughs> quite poor <laughs> Um, no, I, I want to, yeah. you know, watch anime. And yeah. um, it's a, I, I don't have like a, a finishing sort of solution to that. I don't have a conclusion. It's just yeah. a really tough dynamic that I think probably all 
practitioners, all teachers, all, all parents should be thinking about, like, we, we do in some senses know what is best. Um, we've lived longer. We, we have maybe more resources that are, we have access to. But simply by delivering them top down to, to a young person in one ear and out the other, you said, <laughs> like, like it's, it's almost a great way to make sure that they don't engage with it um, genuinely. Yeah. Right. Even if they did have that inclination, maybe a few years later, yeah. it, it comes off as something that's regulatory and bureaucratic and adult, adult and all those nasty mm-hmm. words that, you know, turn us off. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, Dora, I know you were going to chime in there and I kind of cut off with another monologue. But... Um, I think she pretty much said like everything I wanted to say. My bad. But <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Well, I don't know. Like I, so I think we regards we um to what um Zoe said. I think that yes, sometimes like these um relationships don't have like substance, so they don't continue like outside of out after high school. But that that's not always the case as well. Like sometimes, yeah. Because I still have, like, friends See. from high school I cool. still talk to. And they're also in nursing school as well. So <laughs> we talk about, like, similar interests as well. But there are also people that um, I bonded with that, like, they, they are not in nursing school. But we have similar interests. Like, we have, like, similar things we like doing, hanging out, like, and, yeah. Just similar interests. See, relatability, I'm telling yeah. you. Yeah. I was going to say, do your due diligence. Like, if you see somebody that doesn't reach out, don't automatically jump to conclusions that they don't want to talk to you. Mm-hmm. It, it should be on your radar, but don't, t- don't take it as a conclusion. So you want to do your due diligence. If you reach out and they still don't respond or whatever, then I guess you can take it as a confirmation. I mm-hmm. think this, yeah. this, um, this task of creating boundaries is such an inexact one. Like the, You can imagine cases where someone really needs you. And they need you to keep knocking on that door, right? Because they're not in a place where they can answer right now. Um, Or you text them and they don't get back to you. Like, I think we've created a world where we have so many alternatives to genuine interaction and genuine relationship that when we're in a bad way, when COVID hits, when we lose our job, when we lose someone important, right? When when life smacks you in the face, we have TikTok to make us feel like we've got a billion (laughs) friends to relate to, right? And that one text message from the person who really does care just kind of gets lost in the... The, the social media shuffle. Mm. And so I think, as, as you're alluding to, it's important to recognize the signs, like the digital signs of, of close friendship and the, the interpersonal, the, the live signs. Um, we were talking a little bit about that, but I think we kind of elided what, uh, uh, what to look for, right? If we were to, if a teenager were to kind of sit back and assess their friendships right now. Remind me again, is, is there kind of a checklist we can go down for, for what we should be looking for for healthy friendship, healthy, healthy relationship versus something that might be a bit toxic? So um, some signs of a um, healthy relationship, I would say, is having people there to support you like at your worst, when you're at your worst, and um, also looking at if they cheer you on um, when you're like succeeding or um, also do they make when you tell them things like do they make things about the, did they turn it around and make yeah. it about themselves or do they actually um, listen to you listen to your concerns do they um, let you um, express your concerns and your feelings also just kind of like um, so for example if um, I have a friend right now and I tell her, maybe like we have a fight or something, and I tell her, oh, like you did this wrong, and you know, like I don't, I don't like what you did. But then the person kind of like turns it around and makes it, and then acts exactly, yeah, no, and acts like the victim, <laughs> like yeah, it's just you no. Know. <laughs> so that would be unhealthy. But if it's a healthy relationship where you express your concerns and feelings and tell the person, oh, like you did this and I don't like what you did and they acknowledge that you felt that way and they apologize for making you feel that way, then that's a healthy relationship. Yeah, Yeah, I think a more subtle way of recognizing or a more subtle ex- um, example in high school, a big thing. And I was guilty of this. I'm not going to lie, but I've come to fix it. Um, mm-hmm. For example, if I come in. And it's a day of an exam or a test. I'm like, I'm like, oh my god, I only slept for four hours. And then instead of this person, of which 
should be a friend expressing concern like oh my gosh are you okay do you need anything well they're like you only slept for four hours i slept for two and they make it up about themselves yeah. or they start making it into a competition i'm like that was not the point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, the victim Olympics. Exactly. Yeah. I see that so often nowadays, and I'm like, it's not productive. No. It's really not. And it's not relational. Definitely. Right? Like yeah. you're, you're racing each other to a place in a hierarchy, right? Mm-hmm. I'm the, the most hard done by, mm-hmm. right? I am the one who's most in need of care yeah. instead of reciprocating. Right, we're, 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 we've become quite performative, I think, in our in our needs, yeah. our presentation of needs, and in the support that we lend one another. It's not a competition, guys. No. Yeah. And what? You sleep less than me, therefore I'm better. <laughs> no, I, I probably have more headaches. I'm the one yeah. that's you know struggling more. Definitely, when the person like tries to make everything a competition, like no, yeah. no. Yeah. Well, I, I, I hope we've given some idea of what that what a, a healthy relationship looks like. And I'm, I'm especially so grateful that you um, sort of highlighted that as the thing you wanted to talk about. Because, again, we don't often think of relationships as having the place that they do in reality when it comes to our health. Mm-hmm. But they end up being so central. And, and they are the things that make us well. They're also the things that, that consequentially, when we lack them, um, can hurt us the most. Um, and when we when we assess our students and we ask them or we ask ourselves why is the student not able to perform to the level that we know they're capable of we often forget that the the friendships the the parenting and family relationships that they have in their lives may be at the at the center of of whatever's going on with them Mm -hmm. Um, and the relationship with themselves i think that's a big one like i think a good thing is i'm my own best friend you always Mm got to keep yourself company keep yourself in check right you gotta Mm -hmm. date yourself yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I would if I could. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I think another thing about, um, you know, like recognizing healthy and unhealthy relationships is that sometimes, I don't know about anyone else, but for me, um, most times it's like, even though I know like the relationship is unhealthy, like sometimes I might feel guilty to like leave or maybe guilty to like express my concerns and but most times so when that happens to me i just keep like enduring but there's a time when it's like i can't take this anymore (laughs) and then i have to you know like do what's necessary because obviously i also wouldn't want to just cut the person off also because um like we have a lot of memories and i kind of like cherish that person so thinking of what life would be like without that person hurts so much but you also have to understand that it's okay to um do what's best for you and it's okay to um like you know end that friendship like even if even if it feels like even even if you feel like you're going to be hurt or um like things will be the same that it's not the end of the world yeah yeah it's it's tempting to talk about these relationships in, in sort of business terms. Like I was mm-hmm. thinking about sunk costs earlier and like cost benefit analyses. And um, I think we need to remember, Zoe, as you pointed out, that um, communication in mm-hmm. the midst of, of these can sure make that calculus a, a lot easier. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that ultimately we're not engaged in a market transaction here. We're engaged in, engaged in a relationship. And so I guess the most important thing that we can say coming out of this conversation is that um, we need to prize the relationships in our lives. We may need to make them a priority in terms of our self-care. And we need to insist on reciprocity, both from the people who are in our lives, in what, whether it's romantic, fam- familial, or, or fr- uh, friendship relationships. Mm-hmm. We also need to expect reciprocity from ourselves. Right? And, and try to, to break that habit that so many have, myself, I might be the worst at it, of making everything about us. And when we hear someone going through something tough, trying to compare it to something tough that we're going through, mm-hmm. you know, even if you just do it once this week, think about trying to just ask that follow-up question or really dive in and, and engage with what your friend is going through. It's going to make you stronger. It's going to make the healthy relationship uh, 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 even healthier. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the the outcomes of that are difficult to quantify, but they're massive. Yeah. yeah. Great summary. <laughs> <laughs> that English lit degree is paying off. Well, thanks so much for joining me. Zoe, Dora, thank you for the work that you've done here with our students. Uh, I know you're leaving us in a couple of weeks, and we got a whole bunch of kids who are going to be really sad to see you go. Your emphasis, especially on their social and mental health, has been very, very important for them and very impressive for me to see. So a big, big thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Ingrid. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Yay.
Another Braemar Life Skills Academy podcast in the bag. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Be sure to tune in again next week, where I'll be joined by three of our most experienced Braemar students who will talk to us about their experience of the stages of cultural adaptation.